I'm Martha Hurst, Fordham's Senior Vice President, CFO, and Treasurer, and it's my honor and complete pleasure to welcome you to the sixth annual Fordham Women's Summit Philanthropy Empowerment Change. Thank you, yeah. This event celebrates philanthropy, leadership, personal growth, and professional development. Before we begin, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to Fordham trustees, past and present, members of the President's Council, Parents Leadership Council, the Fordham University Alumni Association Advisory Board, many of my colleagues from Fordham, deans, our general counsel, HR vice president and other vice presidents, our chief investment officer, dean of administration, and many, many other colleagues, many of whom are here at this front table, and I'm delighted that you're here, as well as students, alumni, and friends who are joining us today. If you attended the past summits, or if this is your first summit, we're delighted to welcome you in person for the first time since 2019. I can think back to being in my slippers speaking with you virtually. This is a great treat. This will be a day full of opportunities to connect with fellow members of the Fordham community and to engage with speakers who will share with you how, and more importantly, why, they have invested their precious time, talent, and treasure in projects and places they care deeply about, including Fordham. This year's theme, Catalysts for Change, Women Innovators, represents today's overall message and programming how Fordham women across a variety of industries are leveraging their unique, our unique brand of leadership to make a mark on and transform our fields for the betterment of our colleagues and the world around us. Our opening keynote conversation, Women in Leadership and Philanthropy, perfectly fits this year's theme for many reasons. But I would be remiss if I did not highlight perhaps the most significant reason today. In particular, best-selling author and Fordham parent Adriana Trigiani will moderate the discussion with Fordham's 33rd president, Tanya Tetlow. <laughs> president Tetlow, who as you likely know was inaugurated just last Friday, is not only the first layperson but also Fordham's first woman president in the university's 184th history. Adriana Trigiani is a prolific fiction and nonfiction author. Her latest book, The Good Left Undone, was an instant New York Times bestseller and is a Book of the Month, Book Club of the Year nominee. Yep. <laughs> We're thrilled to have both President Tetlow and Adriana Trigiani, pioneers and trailblazers in their respective fields and careers, with us today to share their personal insights and professional wisdom and inspire all of us to continue paving our own paths. Following the opening keynote conversations, we will have two breakout sessions, a panel discussion on entrepreneurship, innovation and transformation, and an emotional intelligence and leadership workshop. Please note that I'll announce the names and locations of those sessions before they begin. But in the meantime, I'll encourage you to review the program and determine which session you'd like to attend. After the breakout session, we'll come back here to Constantino for a buffet lunch. During that time, we'll hear remarks from our scholar speaker, Nishi Akhtur, a junior at Fordham College at Rose Hill, who'll share her scholarship story. We'll then celebrate our seven extraordinary pioneering women in philanthropy to be followed by an optional Ignatian yoga stretch to break up the day. I don't know, did Ignatius do yoga? Uh, Roger, I don't know. But it will refresh our bodies and minds as he would have wanted us to do. The day continues here in Constantino with the panel discussion, A View from the Top, Retention and Recruitment in the Great Reshuffle, and a well-deserved break. We'll conclude the day with our closing keynote panel discussion, a spotlight on corporate social responsibility followed by uh, a last session where I'll make some closing remarks and we'll open the floor to any final thoughts, comments, or questions you might have. We invite you to stay for our networking reception just across the way in the Bateman Room and Soden Lounge, where we can catch up over the day's events, 
on some wine with Macari Vineyards, generously donated by Gabelli School of Business alumna Gabriella Macari. If this is your first summit, we'd like to introduce you to our Fordham Giving Circles. Giving Circles are a form of collective impact and participatory philanthropy, where groups of individuals double, donate money to a pooled fund. Giving Circles serve to teach philanthropy, inspire a new generation of givers, and create a tangible direct return on investment almost immediately. Since 2017, 112 Giving Circle members in 19 circles have joined together to give more than $1 million to Fordham University. We hope to count you among those donors soon. We formed giving circles for each of our schools as well as for the Fordham Fund, which supports the university as a whole. You can choose to support different initiatives and special interests from scholarships to women's athletics, from diversity, equity, and inclusion to STEM. I happen to be part of a Women in Technology Scholarship Circle, together with my colleagues, women in IT, and I'm thrilled about it. We ask that you consider a minimum pledge of $100 per year and a commitment of four years. You can easily join a giving circle or make a one-time gift online in just a few minutes at any point during the summit. Simply visit the Giving Circle page of the summit website at fordham.edu slash giving circles. If you'd like more information, simply join the mailing list for your chosen circle and a gift officer will contact you. You're here today, therefore you already are or wish to become philanthropists. More than half of Fording's living alumni are women, not to mention the university's friends, parents, faculty, administrators, and staff, and other supporters. This means that our potential collective impact on the university we love is boundless. We strongly encourage you to keep today's conversations going well past the summit, by connecting with one another using the hashtag FWS2022 on your preferred social media platform. Now we take a moment to extend our sincere thanks to our corporate sponsors and those who procured those corporate gifts. EY alumna Joy Fernandez, Gabelli School of Business class of 1988. Joy is also being honored as a pioneering woman later today. Macari Vineyards alumna, as I just mentioned, Gabriella Macari, Gabelli School of Business, class of 2009. Gabriella is also a master of wine candidate. We all want to spend some time with her today. <laughs> Tia, Dave Donlin, a good friend to Fordham, director of institutional relationships. Thank you. We could not have done this without all of you. Coming together, we will work to ensure that our leadership is rooted in purpose, wrote our first speaker. We're determined to make a difference because it is the whole point of life. A person with that vision is my kind of leader. And it's now my complete pleasure and honor to introduce our newest colleague, the president of Fordham University, Tanya Tetlow. I am so glad to be here with you and so glad to discover this Women's Summit already in existence because otherwise I would have created it. So <laughs> I'm thrilled to join you, thrilled to be part of this magnificent university that so many of you went to work at, send your children to or your grandchildren um, or have connection to in many deep ways. Um, I. I'm uh, here to talk um, with Adriana in that more authentic way you do with Q&A about women and leadership, and that's uh, both things, right? It's the, the habits of leadership, of how you lead a purpose-filled life, of how you become strategic, how you inspire people, um, create change when people resist it, all of those things. But it's also about our experience as women, where we both get... Um, diminished in many ways, of underestimated, of socialized differently than men. I don't think our differences are innate, but we are raised differently. And one thing I've discovered along the way is I began to do jobs in university administration and read books on leadership, 
Harvard Business Review, all those kinds of things, is how much in the language of um, sort of swaggering CEOs, how much of the traits and aspirations of leadership perfectly match the ways that women are actually socialized, right? Our ability to communicate, to be empathetic, to be diplomats, to be politic. Um, so many of the ways that are encouraged in us as little girls um, and have actually match what good leadership really represents. So, so excited to talk to you about that and to tell you that literally the reason I'm here is a woman named Lindy Boggs who was Congresswoman from New Orleans. Before that, her husband was Majority Leader of Congress. Between them, they served for 50 years in Congress. And she um, was my hero. And I wrote her a letter when I was 16 years old saying, Dear Congresswoman Boggs, I want to be you when I grow up, so could I please meet you to get started on that? And <laughs> her staff was kind enough and knew that she loved doing that work, that she, they scheduled an appointment and I got to come in and I wore my best suit from the Gap, my only suit from the Gap, and, um, and met with her, thrilled, and she um, decided to sort of keep an eye on me and I interned for her and then when she left Congress, uh, had an office at Tulane where I was going to college, and I went to work for her, thinking I'd be joining a vast staff, but it turned out I was her half-time student worker at 19, and her only staff. So I got to learn what it was to be Lindy Boggs. And from her, a woman of deep and profound faith, of incredible political skills, um, and who found her faith not in being isolated from the world and keeping herself pure, but by waging enormous power, right? She's part of the reason that women got to have credit cards in their own name and get bank loans and have access to credit and um, fought for civil rights in so many ways. So she was my hero. And when Bill Clinton asked her to be ambassador to the Vatican, she went there to be the State Department spokesperson to Pope John Paul II and all of these cardinals who run the Vatican State. It's a very important post. And she did that work, as you do when you're 79. She flirted with the cardinals <laughs> like a banshee. And to the horror of the State Department staff, although the cardinals, boy, did they love it. Um, and one of them was Cardinal Dolan, who I just got to meet. And I said, oh, Lindy Boggs. She would call me and say, darling, I need a date to an event tonight. Would you come with me and he just lit up at the memory of it so <laughs> she taught me so much and her daughter Cokie Roberts um, then took over that mentorship of me and even though she had hundreds of her own protégés right she made time mm -hmm. for that and she really taught me that when you get to go through a door as a woman that's so hard fought sometimes there's a temptation to think the young women who come after you are whining and they don't appreciate what they have and all of that, but she was determined not just to help them through that door, but to smash the door down permanently. Mm. And she and the other founding mothers of NPR did that brilliantly. They just, in their quiet determination, sometimes knitting in meetings just to make the men nervous, um, <laughs> just broke down so many of those doors. And so I, when I had that beautiful lunch with Cardinal Dolan, I could feel Lindy beaming from heaven and Cokie smirking, that um, there, there's so much that they taught me. So we are here because we keep teaching each other these lessons, mm -hmm. because we're so determined to pay them forward to the young women of Fordham and beyond. And so there's just no better work than what we do here today. So Adriana, I hope you come up and join me. And Absolutely. We'll have a great conversation. Should I take my next? Eh, why not? Well, you chose the best possible president for this university. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Fordham parent, and I am in love with this school. And I'm in awe of your faithfulness and your generosity. Women get no credit in this world. Tanya and I were talking about this. If you just think of your own mother. I want, uh, could you raise your hand if your mother got the credit she deserved for all she did? Raise your hand. <laughs> usually the sons, Roger, usually the sons go, my mother got credit. Right? <laughs> but the daughters know the difference because we become that. 
And you told that incredible story about Lindy Boggs and Koki Roberts, both of whom really were so elegant, funny, brilliant. And that's how I find you. Because I have to tell you, usually when I come to a Catholic school, you know, there's, there's a nun, and we love our nuns. And I think to myself, we'll go to good lifestyle till I look at their shoes. And I go, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. But they're very comfortable, those do shoes. It. <laughs> but look at your shoes. And I went, OK, we're, we're in good company. <laughs> OK. So we want you to leave this session today. Tanya, we want every, everybody here to leave this session today with a sense of their own creativity and possibility. So I want to start with this. And I want you to just tell me what you think of this. Somebody very wise, a woman, who you wouldn't know at the beginning of my career. She actually ran the boarding house I lived in when I moved to New York. She's incredible. And she said, you got to do three things in life. You got to pick the thing that you love to do. Then the second thing is you've got to be the best at it. And the third thing is to serve humanity. So Tanya. Those three steps, do you see them mirrored in your life? And, and going forward, you realize now as a university president, you're the ultimate role model for every girl that attends, young lady, no young question. woman, yeah. right? And they're going to be looking at you and checking you out totally in every move you make. So can you speak to that? How are you going to encourage our young women at Fordham? Well, they're already so excited, which is just mm -hmm. so much fun, right? The number of selfies I've taken with excited young women. But my, my favorite interactions have been um, the older alumna, particularly from Marymount and Thomas More, and some of them nuns who come up and whisper to me with canes in hand, it's about damn time. <laughs> <laughs> makes me very happy. Um, I, I think that, you know, Part of what we learn as women is we have a fraught relationship with ambition for ourselves. Mm. That we are not really trained that we're supposed to be ambitious, that that's discouraged in us. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that the ideal really is to have a swaggering ambition. That's not actually the point. Mm. But to have ambition for something other than ourselves, for a cause, for a purpose, for what we fight for, that's where women, all the research shows, we struggle to negotiate for ourselves for our own salaries, for example, but we're really good at negotiating for anybody else. And that sense of finding your calling and purpose, because that should be the point for both men and women, um, and really fighting for that. And so at different times in my life, that's what I've tried to do, of focusing on issues from domestic violence to racial justice, um, of then moving into higher ed and what it means to really create opportunity and to create a community where we teach our values, where we teach men and women both as young people of what it means to appreciate talent, to move beyond your own filters and the, the lies and mythology you've been taught about where talent lies and who we all are um, is everything. And so for the young women, it's um, I hope I can model that, but, but not model perfection in any way or, or being high strung or tightly wound, but of finding ways to be comfortable in my own skin, mm -hmm. of feeling confident. And, and I think we all find the older we get, the less we worry about nonsense, right, if we're doing well, um, and to help them with that. Because I see young people in general, particularly young women, um, increasingly anxious. Um, and we raise our daughters often to be very perfectionist. And they are very good at the substance of getting the skills, the discipline, the learning that they need. And they blow it out of the water in their performance in school. Mm -hmm. But that sense of feeling like they can make a mistake and learn from that mistake, that they can feel comfortable about who they are and their ability to raise their hand in life, that, that's everything for them. OK, so luckily. I have a little experience with Fordham students, and that is that the, the, the beautiful team that does the fundraising at the school, um, I, I, I have interns. And um, I get them from all over the country. And, um, and last year, I said, let's do Fordham. Let's just have. And I have to tell you, Tanya, the, they, they were superb. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them to leave. They had to go on with their lives and career. 
but they are trained in a certain way, mm -hmm. and Fordham um, it feeds their soul as much as their ambition, um, and feeds their sense of purpose. How are you going to expand and amplify that? There are thousands of teachable moments for me directly and then with the kind of culture you try to create and that already exists here, right, of building on that strength. So we have the huge advantage of being a Jesuit institution with 500 years of credibility. So this idea that higher ed has come around to if you educate the whole student and you try to have a purpose-driven life, we've been doing that right, for centuries. And so I think for me it's about having moments where when I send messages to the students, when I get to address them, it's not the normal sort of trite platitudes. It is trying to really challenge them of, of stepping into their shoes, of thinking about what they're facing in the world that they're up against and engaging them. So teaching them how to do effective activism, for example, that there's a way that sometimes uh, they think that liking things on social media or yelling at the person most proximate to them counts as effective <laughs> activism. And it's, it often just makes the person who cares about the most have to go drink at night. It doesn't actually achieve anything. Um, is how do you really sit at the table with complexity? How do you find a way to turn up the pressure from the outside but also engage from the inside of all of that work mm -hmm. and to find your purpose in life. And we're not gonna tell you what it is and it will be different across all of the diversity, including ideological diversity of our students, but of having that vocation in life, of that thing that makes you excited. And what that won't be is chasing status or that YouTube version of fame that is this weird thing that exists in their generation, as I see from my 10-year-old. Um, it is about something other than yourself. Right, and, and that will drive you. And the thing I learned, I think, most from Lindy Boggs was if what fuels you is just really loving and engaging with other people, then you don't run out of energy. Mm -hmm. And she never did. Lived to be 97 and never stopped. Well, that's really true, that if you are engaged in something that you love, <laughs> it, it, it increases your energy, it increases your lust for living, Travel, but let's look at women realistically. So we know that we live longer. We also know that a few weeks ago in the New York Times, it was said that we make 68% of the 100% that the men make. Yeah, and women of color even less. Yeah. And well, well, women of color, that is, first of all, and I said this to Eddie Gloud Jr. I, when we were talking about racism, civil rights, I said, Eddie, we can't have any conversation because women of color have it harder than you. And Eddie agreed. So here we are, and this is powerful women in this room, and it is about, it really is about the compensation for the job done. Mm -hmm. So what do you give to the undergraduate that has her under, in a state of, I am deserving, I'm as qualified and educated to get the salary that they should get? Well, some of it is, is teaching the courage to demand and ask for it. And okay. I, have, I have found when I've hired women along the way that often they haven't negotiated over salary. Uh, at all. And I've corrected for that by just offering them what I intended to pay them on the front end without waiting to be negotiated up, right? Mm -hmm. So that's my way of handling that as an employer. Um, so some of it's that. But it's also a recognition that there's plenty of research that also shows that when women do negotiate for salary, they get punished for it. So the idea that it's just on us, that if we're just a little braver than we would earn what men earn is wrong, demonstrably false. So I think that it becomes about fighting as much as you can, of learning the language of the collective. So we aren't just allowed to speak in the I and what's good for me in the same way, because it will be perceived differently. Um, but you find ways to talk about uh, the good of the organization and, and um, neutral processes and objective measures and all those things. Um, and 
It's also about when you have power, when you're an employer, then you can fix it, mm -hmm. right? And, and bothering to do that because there are times when we feel often vastly less secure in the power that we have because it's such a struggle to get it. So when you have it, and this is what Koki did so brilliantly, use it, right? Make sure that you don't do unto others what was done to you. Make sure that you fix the systems, that you think about all of these hidden ways that you've experienced um, by virtue of gender, and make sure they aren't happening on gender or any other topic, um, especially race, and that you um, find ways to matter uh, in that way. But what, what I try not to do with young women, I think we, with all the best of intentions, often tell them, you can do anything you set your mind to, the world is great, you can achieve it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we sell them short when we don't reveal to them that this bias still exists and that they need to be very strategic and careful about how they grapple with it. And when they don't know that, then they, they are much more likely to take that voice into their own heads, mm -hmm. that voice that discounts their abilities, that, that guts their confidence, and that becomes internalized. Then nobody needs to do it to you because you do it to yourself. Right, you make sure that you will be turned down on salary because you haven't even asked. So it's, um, I think it's important to be realistic. And, and I will say as the mother of a daughter who's now 10, when do I say that to her? That she will have fewer opportunities in life, that she will be up against these obstacles because I don't want to tell her that. I don't want to undermine her confidence. And so um, I started off slowly with things like just to react to the messages the world would give her. You know, Lucy, boys can do anything they set their minds to. They can even be doctors and politicians, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, it, so it's, it's hard to walk that line as every parent knows of a daughter or, um, you know, families of color and all the ways that they have to have these brutally hard conversations of when do you do that and how do you do that? But by the time of college, you do that. You mm -hmm. really address it. You have to be very open. direct about it, right? Yeah. Yep. And also, you know, in, in your life story, I mean, is the wisdom. Every woman in this room could take on an intern. Mm -hmm. So I would say the first thing I do if I went to Fordham is I'd find a Fordham graduate to hire me. That's yep. the first thing I do. Yep. Because this... Every, everything I'm reading in the booklet today is about pulling together, which is something you've done your entire career, which I just, I love the trajectory of your career. You, you sought out a mentor. How many of us had the guts to do that? I was sitting here thinking to myself, I never called anybody. <laughs> I wish I would have. I wish I would have. And then when I got into my field, then I began to understand that and, and sought it out. I still, we were talking in the room before about authors that we know, and, and, and it's, I, I want to bring the authors to you. I want you to, you read their books, you know their, their deepest, darkest secrets, you know that the, the way they communicate emotion. We need to have that exchange. You did it. You did it. You sought it out. First thing, maybe with the girls we say, the young ladies, the young women, we say, Find a mentor. Okay, it, 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 it could be anybody. Well, here's what I and tell write them to too, them, which is that, what you did. That you realize when you get asked to be a mentor, it's deeply flattering, right? To have anyone young come up to you and ask for your wisdom, and it also is enjoyable to do it. And so, one thing I tell uh, young people is. Know that if you do it well, if you're care you don't just go up to a stranger and demand that they be your mentor, but if you've done it well, it's actually flattering. You know, you're not putting upon people or, you know, know that when you go into it, that it is a very mutual relationship. Fantastic. So we got that piece. Yeah. But now, when I look around the room, women are also the great reinventors of their own circumstances. The great reinventors. They, they take circumstances in life Turn it around. Your father dies, your mother raises the whole family. Nobody talks about that. Or you go into business and you realize, oh, this is, this is my company now. I'm doing this. So what do we say to the ladies here who, are, who, who, who range in age? Because I love this. At midlife, you basically went, after being a prosecutor, I mean, you were so many things. 
that's impressive. I'm going to I'm I'm going to I'm going to go into the universities. I'm going to I'm going to change it on the cellular level where kids start out in life. And I say this to the ladies in this room because some of you I'm in a, I'm in a profession where school teachers write novels. Frank McCourt, look look at Toni Morrison. They have their greatest success after the age of 60 very often. Very often. Life isn't one, one simple road, is it? And you've got desires and things you want to do. And when you raise a family, you put those aside to do, to try to, you, you, what you do is you just keep making a meatball out of your dreams. It gets a little tighter each time. <laughs> Tanya, tell us, because I find it so inspiring. Tell us how you came to the decision. Loyola then Fordham. We, we, listen, these institutions, as you said, are centuries old, and they're, they're phenomenal. They, phenomenal. The graduates of Fordham are phenomenal. So how, do you, how did you come to a place of reinvention for yourself? Well, Lindy really taught me that life is long, and you have multiple careers, right? She started off thinking she'd be a wife and mother. She was a school teacher. Being a congressional wife meant running her husband's office and chairing all of his campaigns, right? It was a serious job. And then when he died, he disappeared in a plane crash in 1972. They never found him, right? It's the most jarring thing in the world and to not have that closure. So she had to decide to step up and run for his seat, which felt disloyal because it was admitting he was dead. Um, but it also felt like it would be disloyal not to continue his work. So she did that. And then in her... You know, when I worked for her after she left Congress, she was accepting awards full time. That was her job. And <laughs> the plaque du jour, we called it. And, um, and then Clinton asked her to be ambassador to the Vatican in her late 70s, and she did it. So that really helped me understand mm -hmm. that you don't know what you're going to do. And that's very true for young people today. I think they have a better sense of that, that, that you now have multiple careers over the course of a life, that you don't have to know where you're going to land, that you just try to keep as many doors open as possible, that given a choice, take the road that keeps more options open. Now that's but, the ultimate inspiration then, yeah. really. Yeah. That's really true. We can applaud that. That's incredible. So you never stop growing, you never stop learning, you keep, you pivot when you have to pivot. Pivot and Things then are gonna happen to you. Your husband disappears in a plane crash. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Well, I know some of you want him to disappear, <laughs> but not in a plane crash. So I think too that a lot of it's around courage. So there is the, there is the kind of fear that is healthy. Like I have a rule in life that I don't do anything where if I die, nobody will feel sorry for me. So no bungee jumping, no skydiving. <laughs> um, but the fear that gets in your way of what you want to do. When I was young, like almost everybody, I was terrified of public speaking. The first time I tried a case, I couldn't hold my notes because they were shaking so loudly. I had to put them on the podium. And um, of knowing that Every time I did it, I'd be a little less afraid. Um, and I think I've been thinking lately because starting this new job has been a lot, right? Every day I have these constant engagements and interactions with people where they're trying to figure out who I am, where just in being myself, they may misunderstand me or I could say the wrong thing. It's like being on five first dates a day, right? It's that fraught. And of uh, whether courage is a resource you use up and exhaust you of having to use it up all the time, or whether it's a muscle that builds. And I think it's mm. the latter, where mm. you just get better at it. And when you can do that, where now, you know, I thought about it walking up to the stage for the inauguration with 2,000 people in front of me, I wasn't scared, which is so strange. But of just getting to the point where you don't have that fear that gets in the way of your dreams. So I try to pay attention to things I find really daunting. Um, and whether it's financial acumen in your personal life, I can read a spreadsheet with Martha till the day is long. It makes me so happy. If I have to deal with my own retirement savings, I just cannot be bothered, right? But that's a problem. And so anywhere you find yourself putting things off, procrastinating, being intimidated by it to tackle that because that will get in the way of what you want to do. And, and just to sort of start realizing that it's that interaction of what you're good at 
and what you love. And they're not the same thing. Sometimes you're good at things you actually hate. But that you, you find, it, you were talking about the concentric circles, mm -hmm. what you're good at, what you love, and then what matters to the world. And if you can get that right, then mm. life is so exciting. A lot of us are very jazzed about your faith. <laughs> I've jazzed. never had, heard it put it that way, but I love that. Because <laughs> we care about that. Yeah. And you know, in, in, in a university that is Jesuit, Roman Catholic, a lot of us went to Catholic school, a lot of us went to public school, some of us were raised in places where there weren't a lot of Catholics, mm -hmm. some of us were raised in places where it was the monolith. You've written very honestly about your faith mm -hmm. and how, how it became central in your life. And you, you, you had your rebellion too. But what does it mean to you today? And, and, and for you, how does it guide you? Because we're sitting in a room of leaders. How do you tap that to do what you need to do better with more generosity and more largesse? It's so core, it's hard to know what I would be without it to really express that because mm -hmm. it just feels like part of my cellular DNA. But I think it does a few things. Um, my, I was raised by a father who was both an ex-Jesuit and a clinical psychologist. And so I always got this weird overlap in my training of that which the moral lessons of the Gospels and how God wants us to behave, to be generous, to be self-aware, to listen hard, to um, really think about the needs of others is also psychological truth. It is what will make you happy and feel fulfilled in life, right? So I always got both of that sense of this is the path forward, and we know that because of also how our brains are wired to be happy, right? It's when my dad would go to Costco and buy bags of cheap umbrellas, and then in New Orleans, it, you know, we get torrential rains on a moment's notice, and people would get caught in the rain, and he'd roll his window down and give them umbrellas, because it just made him so happy, right? And of, of knowing that, that that's how God has wired us to, to to take such pleasure in generosity, to feel driven by helping other people, to feel connectedness with human beings. Um, and so I think that's what I'm steeped in. And watching Lindy especially, who would you know, take me to mass with her and give me a dollar to put in the collection plate, um, is that that um, sense of, of purpose and also sense of being loved by God, right? That that's what we hope for our students is that total acceptance of not the version of Catholicism of the Inquisition of somehow self-flagellating quite literally, but of the Ignatian version of feeling that God loves us and wants us to be better. And we learn to be better by thinking every night and examine about, okay, what, um, Mm. Ignatius shared this insight of modern psychology. What made me feel good today? Where did I, as in our language, feel consolation? Because that gut feeling that what makes me feel good is, is by being good. And then where do I feel kind of bad in a cringy way where it, it, I didn't live up to who I was trying to be that day? And then to determine not to go into a shame spiral, to quote the movie Clueless, but to really think, OK, how do I do better tomorrow? just tomorrow, just in little ways, right? That that, that sense of, um, of how you keep yourself on a path, of how you drive yourself, and of, of knowing that until you feel the love of God, until you love yourself, it's very hard to love other people properly. Well, most of us know that our parents, when, when our children are in college, is when they really test their faith and they test the, the whole idea of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And they see inequities that they don't like. Yep. And, um, and then I'm reminded about the breaking of the bread because it's really about community, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that the core of it all? Is that when we come together, the breaking of the bread, it's, 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 it's the biggest message of our faith, which is to come together in community and you're all equal in the eyes of God. And, and that shores up the collective souls. So to that point, at Fordham, can you talk about the community there and what you plan to do to shore it up? 
Well, what I found is what drew me to Fordham um, from a city and a school that I love dearly. So this was not an easy decision to make, to move and uproot my life. But Fordham has that incredible combination of elite academics and a really warm and loving community. It's 20% first generation in the undergrad, and that makes all the difference in the world, right? When the culture is set um, by kids who are literally carrying the hopes and dreams of their entire families, of generations of their families on their shoulders, it is an awe-inspiring thing. And I think it makes our student body um, all the more grateful for the experience that they're having. I also think that there's a world in which the students attracted to Fordham because of our Jesuit mission, and some of them come in spite of that, not because of it, right? But the students attracted to the culture we have now and who then help create it are really purpose-driven, and they talk about whether they are religious or not, whether they are Catholic or any other faith, that it's a place where you can be your full self. You don't have to be embarrassed to be religious here, right? Which really matters to me that that, that um, understanding that inclusion is on our side, that what we're trying to do is let you be your full self, and that that language of values, which circulates in many different ways, um, draws the students to be seeking of how to find the right thing to do in a way that's less self-righteous as sometimes this generation can fall into. And I think that that's very real in the community we have here. So my job is to build on that with the students. Um, mm -hmm. And what I said on my inauguration speech to for the faculty and staff who serve the students, who love them so dearly, who are really driven by that, that we make sure that we don't fall prey to the temptation of unrelenting cynicism. That way that we always sort of have low expectations that are never disappointed because we think, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And that we really need to have hope right now because the students are watching us and they want to know if they should have hope. And so that ability to be brave enough to hope, to think that, yes, things might be different and better, and yes, it's worth trying and, and, and you know, working harder to build on our strengths at Fordham to make it ever better. So that, that's been mm -hmm. how I hope to really call us together and to build on what is already an extraordinary community. Well, it's, it's a, that, that, that's one of the important aspects of a Catholic education to parents. You know, parents love this because it means that the deeper truths are being contemplated and the deeper truths are being led by your example and the example of faculty and, the, and, and all those on the campus that are in positions of authority. Um, that you, the, you, we don't leave God out of the equation. Mm -hmm. But women. You're, one of the incredible things about, about your presidency is that you're the first. Now that, to me, is a very scary thing, to be the first in anything. I mean, really, because you're inventing it. You're inventing what this is. Because it's, it's very comfortable, because for years and years and years, we saw a priest. And in a lot of our Catholic schools, we'd see a man. Do you understand from the, the point of view of the younger person what it must mean to them to have you there first? And secondly, in this room, women of purpose and leadership, what it means to them? Well, in the abstract, right, I'm just busy being me, so I don't really <laughs> perceive it on a mm -hmm. daily basis. But I will say the other example we have in the Catholic Church were vast institutions run by women, religious, right? And that way... Well, yes. And, 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 and that, was, that was for Lindy, for example, growing up in the teens and 20s, in the early 20th century. She knew a world where women ran hospital systems and universities and high schools, right? So we have that example as well, which is kind of rare in the rest of um, mm -hmm. uh, our history in this country. Um, I think, you know, I try to be conscious in some ways of the ways people react to it as different, although not to let that trip me up because there's, you know, there's only so much you can do, but just to be aware of it in the same way that young women should be aware of it. But my favorite story, which I tell because in um, uh, full knowledge that the person involved will have no memory of it, 
because I sat down with a major donor at Loyola and, and said I take very, he was very traditional Catholic, I take very seriously being the first lay person to run the university and being driven by faith, you know, and I was about to explain all of that and he interrupted me to say, well, it's not just that, it's that you're a woman that bothers people. And <laughs> in his out loud voice. And for once I thought of the response at the moment and not a month later, um, I said, well, you know, there's not much I can do about that that you would approve of. And it was <laughs> perfect because it went right over his head. <laughs> but I think, you know, he ultimately became a major donor to the university, right? People get used to it. And I think that's a lot of the power of this is that this is so exciting for so many mm -hmm. of us right now. But pretty soon, those college students will think that a university president looks like me, right? And that will be their image, and that's my daughter's image. And so I, that, that is the, the power of this, is that we just stop squandering half the world's talent, right? We're well, never going to get know, anywhere without that. When we talk about women in history, we're not there. 50% mm -hmm. of history hasn't been written. Because yep. you can't even find us there. I mean, there's Amelia Earhart, but she got lost. I don't want to like her. <laughs> so. For you, mm -hmm. we really are on the cusp of something. But I'm gonna let's talk about let's talk about Fordham, and why the folks in this room invest in Fordham. I, I get it now. I understand now since I have a daughter there. Mm -hmm. but there is, you know, we I know we we love Loyola in, in, in New Orleans, but it's New York or nowhere, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, I, seriously, and and we. If you fan out a little bit in publishing and media and television, you find the Fordham graduates. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. If, if there's somebody on a crew with my husband, my husband's lighting designer, where'd you go? Fordham. It's the combination of, of, of moxie and guts yeah. and that city savvy mm -hmm. and a working class ethic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have never been on a campus where those two things are vibrant. Yep. And by the way, those attributes come in all colors, all religions. And I have to say it too, sometimes the men are involved in that too. Mm -hmm. They're talented, <laughs> right, Roger? So that this is a women's summit, I think it's important to say that mm -hmm. because the, the community at Fordham is reflective of when you go around and look at colleges and you come, to, uh, we went everywhere. Last place we went was Fordham. The feeling was entirely different than it was anywhere else. So something special for a very long time has been happening there. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I, I'm, I'm a little bit in awe of what you're gonna have to do because part of now with these higher education is you have to get your school to the front of the class, so to speak. Right. So how can the women in this room help you do that? There are, uh, I think the way ahead is to double down on mission. That the students right now, this generation of students, is pretty cynical, right? They're inheriting a world that is deeply broken and they feel it and they're worried and they've you know, gone through so much in their lives, including using, losing years of their adolescence to this pandemic. Losing a couple years of middle age, not that big a deal, right? I, love, I started baking again, it was great. Losing years of your teenage time when you're growing and you're, you're creating connections and learning how to build relationships, that's pretty brutal. And what they want to do is matter. And they don't want to just be virtuous and volunteer. They want to change systems and question assumptions and push on authority, which is all very Jesuit. They don't know that. We have to explain that. But it is very, there's a reason the Jesuits get into trouble all the time, right? And so we have that advantage of having in our DNA this willingness to challenge and to have an impact and to do it at the epicenter of the global economy mm -hmm. here in New York, right? The chance to have an impact, and that's why I came, is so great here because we can convene the most powerful people 
in the world as the Gabelli faculty have been doing in many ways to, to pull together what corporate social responsibility looks like within each industry. Um, we can do so much. And so for us, I think the path ahead is to actually just focus on who we are, is not to chase status for its own sake because it doesn't work and because it's not the point. Um, but to really double down on that, that's what will bring us the best and brightest students. That's what will have us matter to the world. And at this moment, the world is fallen apart in all sorts of ways. And that sense of urgency that we have to feel like what we're doing makes a difference, that's where Fordham needs to be. And we're building on huge strengths there, the brilliant faculty, their research, their um, strategy, but also just continuing to have immediate impact, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't just about chasing research grants and awards. It's about how we really matter. So I think that's where we're going to continue to mm -hmm. head. And the ways you make a difference are those paying forward the opportunity that Fordham gave you, that chance to build on our greatest strength, which is our economic and racial and other diversity um, by the scholarships that you fund. It's the kind of transformative gifts that people like Kim Bepler have given us to push us ahead in the sciences that we can uh, have an impact in the kind of rock star faculty that we're able to attract and retain here. It's all of that. The trajectory of universities is really about two things. One is some universities are wealthy because they have focused on educating the elite for 400 years and then have the power of compound interest in an endowment and that works out really well. And they sort of kept out people like our ancestors, right? And then there are the universities who find ways to take people um, who everyone else underestimated to recognize their blazing talent to and their determination and to turn it into incredible achievement. And then to have those people, even though often they haven't had generations of wealth to make them comfortable with philanthropy, to pay it forward anyway. And when you look at who gives the most across American society, it's the lowest 20% of American incomes give the highest percentage of their wages to charity. Right, wrap your mind around that, is that sense of why it matters and how important it is and to really make a difference. And so that power of that, of when our community comes together to make Fordham continue to be ever more of what it was for you, that's, that's what will push us forward. You know, I, I, to quote Stevie Van Zandt from the E Street Vans, <laughs> he, he he talks about STEAM, you know, tech, sciences, the arts, but the A is for art. Mm -hmm. And Fordham is, a, um, is really a shining city in this way, mm -hmm. having spent time on the campus. Is the Gabelli Business School, for example. Now you have a lot, of, a lot of kids that go into insurance, Wall Street, fantastic, right? They're mentored in. And you also have an incredible theater department, mm -hmm. English department. I mean, I'm stunned by it. the history department, the religion department. Now, when you travel to other schools, you don't, you don't get excellence in all areas like that. You really don't. They're known for one thing. But again, that, that New York or nowhere vibe of every department, from, from my seat, strong, powerful. Um, so ahead for you. And the, and, and, the, and the folks in this room, the women in this room, what can we do in that way to shore up what's the most essential part of a university, which is the learning, mm -hmm. right? I'm here to tell you, too, I had a daughter two years in COVID. She's a junior now. The university handled COVID like a dream. She was in a room. She had her college experience for two years now. A little compromise, a little this, go, go get your food. Somebody gave you food through a screen door. And you'd go out eat in the yard. Okay, good. It's all right. It's all right. But, but fostering that sense of community, even as. So in terms of, of the, the mission, oh. the education mission, uh, we're investing in Fordham. What do you, what, what do you see? It's... Um... It's all of that. It's the academic support. It's the scholarships. Mm -hmm. It's the student help. Um, because for a lot of our students, 
if they're having to work two and three jobs on the side, it's really tough for them to stay focused on the academics. So the ways that you help um, prevent that. Um, and I think, you know, our core in the liberal arts and humanities and making the connections for students of why that matters too, because um, on the issue of climate change, which they rightfully care about more than any other, half the battle is how to wake people up out of their denial and cynicism and understandable not wanting to think about it. I feel that way too a lot of the time. That that's where the humanities come in of how you learn the lessons of history, of how you um, teach people human empathy is often through literature and art and music and theater, putting yourself in the shoes of someone else's experience by reading a novel. Um, that is really profound work too. And to make clear, this isn't just um, training ground for graduate school. This is also work that matters deeply. Whatever you do in your life, that ability to think critically, to express yourself well, to persuade people of things um, is, is enormous. So I'm so excited at our strengths in those areas too and to make more use of being right here at Lincoln Center. We are part of Lincoln Center. We aren't just next to it. Um, to work more with Juilliard and with all the cultural institutions that are within a few blocks of us uh, because that spectacular creativity in our students, whether they make a career in that or just become really creative leaders in business, matters enormously too. Well, how fantastic, what, I mean, beautiful. <laughs> I mean, so. Yeah. I mean, we could be here all day with Tanya. You're spectacular. We thank you already for your great service, your acumen, your humor, your insight, your care, uh, your love for this great university already, which will only grow and we thank you so much for this conversation because we all learned a lot. Oh, and, and we have great. a gift for you, which is I was very happy to find out that Fordham doesn't just make ties for men. We have beautiful scarves for I women. I think I'm going to get a so slip. You get a scarf. Does anybody remember what that is? <laughs> right. Yes. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled.